Welcome. Thanks Welcome, for everyone. Us. Thank you for joining Hamilton Families. We appreciate you all being here this evening. Edwin, thank you for joining us. So nice for you to be with us. Hi, Allison. So happy to have you and Gobi be here to support us. Just a quick reminder for everybody as you're logging in and signing in, um, just to make sure to have your name and pro pronouns um, up on, on your video so we can see who's here with us tonight. Welcome, Margie. Thank you for being here this evening. Hello, happy to be here. Trying to get my um, video working. Great. Hi, Anne. Thank you for being here this evening. Great Hi, to hey there. Hello, hello. Hey, Lauren. Hi, Steve. All right. Well, it looks like we're slowly dropping in as we end our work days. Um, I think it might be time to get us started. Uh, so I'll pass it off to our board chair, David. Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to this wonderful event and taking the time out of your busy day. I am David Golden, and I have the honor and the privilege this year of being the chair of the Board of Directors of Hamilton Families. Uh, it goes without saying during this crazy time, uh, I hope you and all of your families are well, staying safe and trying to navigate successfully through one of the most difficult periods, uh, clearly, of our lives and our time. Um, tonight is an exciting night uh, for all of us, particularly for me, who also was the chair of the search committee that brought us our new and amazing CEO, Kiriel Noon, who we'll be introducing tonight. And I'm so proud and honored uh, to be able to have Hamilton families basically introduce Kirill to all of you. It's going to be very exciting. Um, we are here tonight uh, because there's still a lot of work to be done, and we do it in collaboration with all of you. In light of the times of this year, we know that there is so much more that needs to be done to build housing justice and racial equality in our community in the Bay Area. Our hope is tonight that we can spend this moment to just pause, take a break, to center on our mission and the vision of Hamilton families and, and the work that we do every single day in our community to build a more equitable Bay Area. I wanna also take this opportunity to thank our special partners, Salesforce and our board colleague, Ebony Beckworth, Beckwith, uh, both of which have been working with us for over 15 years on this exciting adventure. The Hamilton family would like to also take a special moment to honor Jason Mandel, who was an eight-year board member when the CEO position became uh, suddenly vacant and an interim was required. Jason stepped up at a time where he not only left his own San Francisco company, but he decided to take a new adventure in life and become the interim CEO of a nonprofit. And he turned out to be, quite frankly, the right person at the right time and the right place, never having anticipated he would have to navigate through the COVID-19 crisis and all of that that it entailed. So, we are eternally grateful to Jason 
who held down the fort during this time until we were so very fortunate to find Kerry Moon as our new CEO. And in Jason's honor, we have kicked off our, our year-end fundraising campaign by launching a special fund in Jason's honor. And those funds will be used specifically uh, to fund uh, special things for the essential service workers of Hamilton families who are on the front lines every single day, keeping our families and our, our staff uh, safe from COVID-19. So we are eternally grateful to Jason, and I would like at this time to turn it over to Jason and let him say a few words. Thank you so much, David. Hello, everybody. It's, it's awesome to see so many uh, friendly faces uh, that I worked so closely with uh, earlier this year. Uh, it, it's a real honor to have that gift opportunity be made in my honor uh, for the staff. And, um, you know, I think as, as many of you have heard me say in my time in this role, I, I can't put into words how impressed I was by the entire Hamilton family's team of 150 or so staff that are devoted and smart and hardworking and really committed to our mission of ending family homelessness in our community from the senior leadership to the staff at our facilities. Uh, just a, a unbelievable uh, how uh, sturdily they went through the ups and downs of 2020 and adapted to our more difficult circumstances and, and just kept going. So kudos to everybody. It's great to see so many of you here. Um, I also wanna thank again, the, 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 the incredibly devoted and talented board of directors and thanks to David for his partnership as well as Paige. And um, I, I'm really excited to see uh, how Hamilton progresses in the years ahead. Uh, Curio was an amazing choice. Uh, I knew it from the first time I chatted with him and uh, excited to see him take, that, take on the leadership post. Thanks to all of the supporters who were with us here tonight, uh, many of which I, I had interacted with this past year. Obviously, we can't be doing this work without your generous support. So many of you have stepped up in, uh, in, in very special ways this year to, to help us adapt to our new situation. And we appreciate the ongoing support that we need to do our work. So thanks again and best wishes to everybody. And uh, now I'm gonna, <laughs> sorry, uh, gotta do my intro to uh, our incredibly awesome board member, Karina Moreno. Hi, Karina. Hi, Jason. And thank you, Jason. Truly, you stepped up big time for Hamilton families and you'll always be a part of the Ham fam. So gracias. Uh, good evening. I'm Karina Moreno. I'm a board member with Hamilton and really delighted to be with everyone here tonight. I want to start by acknowledging where I call home and where I suspect many of you are logging in from throughout the Bay Area which is Ohlone land. So a moment of respect for the Ohlone peoples who came before us. As a Bay Area native and as someone who has devoted my career uh, to building a better Bay Area, I've really come to appreciate the importance of coming together, of building trust and of getting to know one another as people. And that's really what tonight is about. It's about getting to know our fabulous new CEO, Curiel Noon, someone who I am really excited uh, to work alongside uh, and to learn from, frankly. Um, and my hope is that you will see and hear and feel some of the inspiration and commitment and resolve that I and my fellow board members got to witness throughout the interview process of Curiel. So without further ado, I wanted to pass it on to my fellow board member from Salesforce, Ebony Beckwith. Hello everyone, it's so nice to be with you today. I'm Ebony Beckwith and I'm a proud board member of Hamilton Families, an organization on the front lines of homelessness. The Bay Area really relies on Hamilton Families to build housing, bring belonging and stability to families and drive equity in our community. And I've had the pleasure of partnering with Hamilton Families for years in my role as CEO of the Salesforce Foundation and Chief Philanthropy Officer at Salesforce. And it's been incredible to see the organization's growth and its ability to pivot quickly to respond to the needs of our communities, especially throughout this crisis. 
Now tonight, I'm excited to welcome Hamilton Families' new CEO, Kiriel Noon. Now, Kiriel joined Hamilton Families as the CEO in October 2020, and he brings with him over 20 years of leadership experience in San Francisco and has dedicated his life to solving some of the community's biggest challenging. He's led work at Juma Ventures, San Francisco AIDS Foundation, and Glide. Now, in getting to know this amazing man, I've been inspired by his candor, his authenticity, his humor, <laughs> and unwavering commitment to his work. And I know you'll be inspired too. So we're going to dive right in, everyone. So Kiriel, it's so nice to be here with you today. <laughs> Thank you, Ebony. It's so nice to see you too. <laughs> it's good to see you again. Now, to kick things off, I'd love to learn a little bit more about you. So can you tell me something about yourself that people may not know about you? I'm originally from New York City, and you know, there's still a part of me that is still very much a New Yorker. I still walk too fast, I talk too fast, I want everything yesterday. Um, but I've lived here in San Francisco for 20 years, and this is home. I grew up in a family that lived in public housing. I'm the oldest of seven kids. And you know, for many of those years, my mom was single, and I watched her struggle to pay rent and keep us in school and keep us on the, right, on the straight path. And she did so. And you know, I think some of that early experiences of growing up in Harlem in New York really sort of, you know, led me to, to this kind of work, to feel some empathy for working mothers, working women, particularly working women of color, um, and who are struggling to keep their families on the, on the straight and narrow and keep food on, food on the table and keep their kids in school. And so, you know, I know that my life could have turned out very, very differently than it could have without my, without my mom being such a strong figure. And I feel like I've been given incredible gifts. You know, I wound up going to great schools. I, you know, got a great education. And, you know, I feel an obligation to give something back to the communities that, that I came from. You know, that it wasn't, it's not enough for me to just kind of rest on my laurels. I feel an obligation to really sort of fix some of the problems that are afflicting our, our communities. And this is one of the ways that, that I'm trying to do that. Um, I think uh, some of the problems that we're looking at are, are not, they're not individual problems, they're systemic problems. You know, they're problems, it's not a surprise that, you know, black and brown women are, you know, are struggling in, in a society in which, you know, racism is so rampant and misogyny is so rampant. Of course, these are the, these are the people who are going to suffer the most. And so I feel like righting some of those wrongs is part of what we're trying to do here at Hamilton Families. And I'm excited to be a part of a team that's doing it. We are excited to have you. So we're going to jump right in. And thank you for sharing that backstory with us. That was really nice to, to learn a little bit more about you. So we know that to understand homelessness, we have to understand the people behind it. And you've been doing this work for quite some time. Is there a story or an anecdote that comes to mind that might help ground us in what it's like for people experiencing homelessness? Sure. I mean, you know, people experiencing experience homelessness for a variety of different reasons. Everybody's story is unique. Um, but one story that comes to mind about the primacy of, of housing and how important housing really is, we had, when I worked at Glide, we had a staff person, a young man, African-American, early, maybe mid-20s. Um, you know, he was, he came to work for us. He was living at the time with his auntie in Oakland and he made it to work on time and he was doing well with our clients and he was, he was a great, a stable, you know, stable uh, staff person. And then something happened and we noticed that he was, his temper was fraying, he wasn't as gentle with clients, he was coming to work later and later, he wasn't quite as kept as he, as he used to be. And we had a supervisor ask him what was going on. It turned out that he had had some kind of fight with his auntie and she didn't want him to stay with her anymore. And so he'd been living in his car. And so, you know, as these things can do, it spiraled. He was living in his car. He got a parking ticket. He got another parking ticket. The car got a boot. It got impounded. And all of a sudden, he had nowhere to live. Fast forward a few weeks. This kid is living on the street in a tent with a woman that he met. And he was using meth very heavily. And his, his situation just devolved very, very quickly. And all because he had lost his housing. And I think, you know, we had to let him go from his job and he was involved in some low level crimes and wound up in prison. And, you know, if he had been able to keep his housing, that one sort of stabilizing factor, he would be able to keep his job and have his life would have been in a very different place. So I think it's, you know, it, it really is important that taking the housing first approach is really vital to the success and stability of families. That's such a, an important story. And I think a lot of people are unaware of what contributes to homelessness. And there, there can be 
so many factors. And I think that a lot of the factors are also very overgeneralized. You know, people think it's just drugs or alcohol can be the only cause. So what are, let's talk about some of the factors that lead people to experience homelessness. You named one of them, but there are many others. Can you just talk about that briefly? There are indeed. I think a lot of them, you know, when I'm really thinking seriously about this question, I have to think upstream that, you know, a lot of these factors are systemic, that they, they stem from, you know, poor access to education. They stem from poor access to well-paying jobs. They stem from poor access to health insurance and, you know, uh, subsidized childcare so people can work. And so there are really a lot of factors that play into, you know, a family becoming homeless that may or may not have anything to do with drugs or alcohol at all. Uh, sometimes, of course, those are factors, but there may be factors, you know, like domestic violence that drive, that drive a, a, you know, a mother to, to leave her husband or boyfriend and take the kids off and they become homeless that way. It's a really complicated, a much more complicated story than people are led to believe. Um, I think there's also you know, sort of a public opinion piece that we need to work on. I think we have an opportunity to sort of change people's perceptions about family homelessness in particular. There's an empathy gap between people who live in homes and people who don't. And I think in San Francisco in particular, where we see such visible signs of homelessness around us all the time, that many of us are desensitized to these questions and are able to sort of step over the person in front of us without ascribing to them any real humanity or wanting to give them, you know, the benefit of the doubt about their story. And so they just, it's easy enough to say in your head, oh, another drunk person or another person high on crack and not really sort of you know, afford that person the full range of human emotions that, that they really are, that they really should be afforded. So it is complicated. Um, and I think that part of what we're trying to do here at Hamilton Families is really sort of dignify each family and give them the value that, that, they, that they deserve. That's right. You know, I love that you mentioned the empathy piece. I, I really do think that that's missing. And that kind of goes to my next question. I hear people say all the time in sort of a, a, a a callous way. So much, so much money has gone into solving homelessness. Why haven't we solved it already? Um, you know, like it's just a, it's a simple problem. And I think it, it kind of, it just it really does shed a bad light on, on the situation. In your experience, what has been effective in breaking the cycle of homelessness, the most effective? To start with is really sort of changing public opinion about it. And I think one of the things that, that I'm seeing about this COVID situation is that it has allowed us to think in new ways about old problems that, you know, COVID uh, exacerbated problems that already existed. So problems with the healthcare system, problems with, you know, racism in the housing, problems with um, the educational system, problems with the childcare system. They were all just sort of exacerbated problems that already existed and made them visible to everybody else. And I think given the situation, we have an opportunity now to really sort of look at these challenges with new lenses and sort of solve them with, with new solutions. So some of the things that actually work are well-funded programs that work. You know, I mean, you've got to, there's something to be said for a program that is funded fully. You know, a lot of our work is, um, is funded by contracts through city and state government. And as, as much as I love those government dollars, they, they never really are enough to cover the full cost of the programs. And so it really is important for us to do um, significant fundraising to make sure that we can make those programs whole so that we can have the best possible outcomes for our families. Um, we also need to make investments in evaluation and impact to make sure that our, that our programs are doing what we think they're supposed to be doing with regard to the outcomes for our families. I think the other thing that works is that when we start to think about housing as a human right, you know, I mean, it is one of the things that, you know, as we talked about earlier, that without stable housing, all things, other things go awry. And I think once we sort of think about, you know, housing as a human right, something that everybody deserves fundamentally, then we can change the way, the way, the way that we think about uh, providing housing for everyone involved. Um, I think the other thing that works is uh, public-private partnerships, that it's not really enough for us to, you know, rely on government sources as, as a society, but I think it's also important for us to leverage companies and, you know, companies that have incredible wealth and incredible interest in being socially responsible and being good neighbors in our society and really sort of working with those partnerships to make better outcomes for the families that we're serving. Couldn't agree more on that last point. <laughs> <laughs> you <agree>. would. Yeah. <laughs> I want to go back to something you said um, about impact. And I know that Hamilton Families is 
all about measuring it, its success. And in fact, your team's data-driven approach to impact is one of the many things that drew me in and made me really um, want to work with you all in a different way. So tell us how you're, you'll measure your success in terms of managing the agency and the, and the family served. Well, I think for starters, one of my um, goals is for us to meet our obligations, both contractual and ethical. Whenever we take money from a funder, we have obligations that we promise to do certain things with that money. And we, one of the things that I want us to make sure, be sure that we do is to hit those numbers, make sure that we serve, serve the number of families that we said we're going to serve when we took the money from our funders. We, the other is ethical. I think, are we doing the best for our families? Are we making the best decisions in our programming for our families? Are they, are they having the best outcome on the people that we're serving? And so that's sort of another bar that I will use to measure success. One of the others is, you know, is Hamilton families a good place for staff to work? Are we providing uh, an environment in which there's equity internally to, in, to the organization as well as externally? Um, we want this place, we want Hamilton to be a place where staff are learning and growing and they're making enough money that they feel valued and that they can have their own stable housing in their own families. I mean, it would, would be a terrible thing for us to serve families and then not, not pay our, way, our, our staff enough, uh, you know, to have stable housing on, on their own. Um, one of the other things I would like to measure is um, our impact on public policy. I think we have an opportunity with our proximity to our, our, our participants and their experience of homelessness to share with policymakers. I think that we have an opportunity to be a bridge between you know, what's happening on the ground with families and policymakers over here who are making decisions that are not necessarily informed by those experiences. And I think you know, if we can sort of begin to sort of do that in a very systematic way, I will be very, very pleased with our impact. Earlier, I said that one of the things I appreciated about you was your candor, and that answer was so clear and direct. <laughs> uh, no fluff, here's what we're going to do, here's what I want to do. I love it. I'm so excited uh, that you are in this role. All right, so uh, this work can be very, very challenging, but also very rewarding. So I'd love for you to share some of those aha moments you've had while working with people experiencing homelessness. There have been quite a few, actually. I think you know, like many of us, I was ignorant of, of how people who are experiencing homelessness really live. And I believe when I first started doing this kind of work, I was surprised uh, by how, how, how much community I found uh, in this population that I felt like, when I walked in, I thought, oh, it must be, you know, the experience of homelessness must really sort of shape their everyday, every moment, every waking moment. That's not in fact the case. I think I was so ignorant that I was not ascribing to people the full range of human emotion that I experienced. So what I was surprised to find was um, incredible generosity, joy, incredible resilience that, you know, I watched people who didn't have two of anything share everything and, you know, and, and lean on each other in times of stress and trauma and really sort of support each other through some of the most difficult things that were happening in their lives. And so I was surprised to find that level of community and resilient support. And looking back on it, I should have been surprised. Of course, we would find that it's in, it would be almost impossible to survive living on the street without having some level of community and support around you, um, how, how, whatever that looked like. That's a really good aha. And I think many of us would probably have that same, that same experience. So I probably should have started here, but you've been on the job for six weeks, right? Uh, maybe a little over six weeks. What is your first impression of Hamilton families? First impression was, wow, there's a lot. Um, I didn't realize how complex the suite of services really was. Um, you know, ranging from, you know, the shelter to transitional housing to Holloway to housing services to eviction prevention services, there really is like a breadth and depth of services that I wasn't fully aware of walking in. And so I realized that I had a very steep learning curve ahead of me to sort of get up to speed on, you know, what we were, what we were actually doing. The other thing that I've learned is that the folks who do this work here are incredible, incredibly talented, incredibly committed, incredibly devoted to the work, incredibly devoted to the outcomes for the families, and are really passionate about doing the work that they're doing. And so I've been really heartened by the strength of the staff that I found, um, and it's been really, really great. You know, 87% of our participants are, of, are people of color, and 75% of those are women, and are women-led households. And so I think and that, I didn't know that walking in, but learning that, I think that we have an opportunity to sort of recenter and reorient our operations to really accommodate that reality that are our programs designed for single moms of color 
And can we sort of re reorient our programming and the way we talk about our programming to really accommodate that lived experience? Um, one of the other things I can say that I've learned is that, you know, this work is not done in a vacuum, that there is a vast network of partnerships that make this work possible, um, including the city and county of San Francisco and a lot of other sister organizations that do this, that do similar work with the same population. And so I won't list them all, but, you know, obviously Salesforce is one of them. Thank you very much. Um, we, we work with Google and SFUSD and the Department of Homelessness and Supportive Housing, DCYF, and so on and so forth. And I think without that web of partnerships, this work is really not possible. And so learning how deeply embedded we were in that network was really, was really important for me to get my, hand, my hands around when I arrived. I see you've had a busy first six weeks for... <laughs> oh, just, a, just a little bit busy, a little. I want to go back to something you said um, about the team. Uh, you have been getting to know this amazing team, and I just really want to spotlight um, and highlight them. So I'd love to hear what inspired you um, from the conversations you've had with the team. You know, one of the things that inspire me about this team is that they mirror the population that they come from, and they are able to empathize and speak to the population, to their participants in their vernacular. And they really sort of get our population and they get the challenges that are facing them because many of them have lived experiences of their own to fall back on. And so there's something about that that I find really unique about this organization and the staff that they come from the communities that we serve. Um, they are also super engaged in the work that they're passionate about. And there's something to be said for people who bring their best selves to the work and are tireless in their efforts to do, to do the best that they can for the participants that we serve. Um, finally, you know, I actually just today I had a conversation with an, uh, a stability specialist who, you know, was incredibly professional, but also very precise in the way she was thinking about changing the systems that affect some of our participants. And I, I think that level of sophistication about not just pro providing a service, but thinking about the environment in which that service is provided and ways that we can change that environment to make the, to make the experience of the participant better has also been something that I've been, I found very impressive about the staff. They have, they're systems thinkers as well as sort of service providers. All right, so give us a sneak peek into what you're working on and what's to come. Drum roll, please. <laughs> um, <laughs> a couple of things come to mind. And granted, I've only been in the chair for a little while, so some of this is not fully baked yet. But I think one of the things that I would like to see is a formal mechanism by which we can get input from our, our participants, both current and former. Um, we're thinking about a community advisory board, building a community advisory board that can share with us, um, can share back to us their experience of our programs and how they've experienced you know, post, pre and post our program and sort of give us feedback onto how we can do things better. Um, I think that is really an important sort of feedback loop that I would like to see built. Um, and so we're working on creating that mechanism. One of the other things I, I thought we might do is sort of recenter the work around single moms of color and really sort of think very intentionally about building robust programming that, um, that centers around their, their, partic their particular needs. I think we already do that to a certain extent, but really sort of lifting it up and being intentional about saying, this is the vast majority of the people who are experiencing our services, so let's really sort of tailor our offerings for the black and brown women who are the majority of our clientele. Um, and the other thing I want, to, I want to say is that we, are, we need to initiate a strategic planning process. I think it's time. The environment is, is changing rapidly around us, and I think that it's time for us to really sort of engage our staff and our board to uh, really sort of build an innovative, forward-thinking strategic plan so that we can you know, have a roadmap ahead of us to take us to the place that we want to be. And you know I love a strategic plan, so I'm all in on to help with that one. <laughs> I'll be definitely calling on you to help us for sure. <laughs> all right, finally, and this is a fun one, have you picked up any interesting hobbies or new skills during the pandemic? Um, I wish I could say that I have, but because the work that I've been engaged in both here and at GLAD has been in essential services, I've been going into the office pretty much during the whole period. Um, so I can't really say that I've you know, learned Cantonese or you know, I learned how to macrame, <laughs> like that's really not been the case. Um, but I have been watching a lot of Netflix. Um, <laughs> well, that counts. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give that to you as <laughs> some points there. It's really been fun. I, you know, the part of me that is a religious studies scholar, I can't really turn that stuff off. And so my partner and I recently watched Schitt's Creek 
And it is in many ways like, a, it's a great show, right? Very guilty pleasure of mine too. <laughs> and I, I love it both because it's funny, but also because it's a conversion narrative of, you know, and really sort of this old literary trope. And so the religious studies scholar in me is kind of thinking, wow, this is, you know, not unlike Saul of Tarsus, you know, turning from becoming, you know, a hater into having this sort of traumatic experience on the road and then really becoming, you know, this, you know, sweet, loving human being. And watching the, you know, the roses go through that was really sort of an interesting, an interesting thing to see. I love that show. I do too. Well, thank you. This was so nice to chat with you. I am so excited to continue working with you as a board member and to strengthen the Hamilton family's community and all the work that you and your team are doing. So just thank you so much for your time today. It was a pleasure getting to know you better and I'm sure everyone watching is going to be inspired by you and is, can't wait to work with you um, closely as well. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you and your contribution. I'm looking forward to working with you on the strategic plan and everything else that's ahead of us. Thank you so much, Ebony. Sounds good. And now I'm going to pass it off to my fellow board member, Karina Moreno, to close us out. Wonderful. Thank you, Ebony. Thank you, Curiel. Um, one of the phrases that really stood out to me was you said, um, and has been really true of my experience with Hamilton, is the way in which we seek to dignify each family. And I think that is so true. Um, you know, dignity is such an important part of the human experience. And just um, thank you for elevating that point. Um, we really would love to open it up to questions. So please continue to send them on through the chat. I have a few that I've jotted down and seen, but please, this is your opportunity um, to ask questions of Curiel. I, of course, am gonna abuse my hostess prerogative though and ask the first question um, to kick us off. And it's actually a question that I asked at the very tail end of the interview process with Curiel and his answer really uh, struck me and stuck with me. And I wanted to ask it again in this setting uh, for the benefit of our partners and supporters to hear it as well. And so the question is, who inspires you and why? Great question, Karina. Thank you. Um, I think my answer is different today, just because we are in a different place today. Um, my answer today is Stacey Abrams and the army of Black women who are showing us what it means to be American citizens and who are really sort of making democracy work. Um, I just, you know, when I think about the tireless work that Stacey Abrams and that team of people did to flip Georgia blue this for this election, I just get goosebumps. And I just feel like, you know, there's, we gotta have a shout out for Stacey Abrams and that, that group, group of people who really made that work and made that happen for us. I, I think the election outcome would have been very different perhaps than if, if that hadn't happened. So I'm gonna say today it's Stacey Abrams. Right on, word to that, and I'll second that, and it was as good of an answer the last time I asked it. And you know, remember, the best part of that question is there's no right answer, and it can change from time to time because many, many people inspire us, right? Um, but that's a really good one, so thank you for that. Um, let's see, I have a question here from Susan. Um, so how can we work more effectively with other nonprofits that are also in this space? And I know many of our friends and colleagues are, are with us here tonight, whether it's Compass, Family Services, Tipping Point, others, you know, how can we work more effectively together? What are your thoughts on that? Um, I have a couple, actually, it's a good question. I think better communication, I think we all, you know, the way the nonprofit sector is structured, we all have our little our little fiefs, you know, and we keep our, you know, we jealously guard our borders. And I don't think that's necessary, particularly now. I think the, the best part of the work is when we work together, we have the best outcomes when we work together. None of us uh, individually have the capacity to really affect the kind of positive social change that we're all looking for. So we have to work together. And if we have to, and that means we have to, co we have to communicate and that means we have to coordinate our efforts. Um, so I think there are ways that we can do that both formally and informally. Um, and I think the best way for, to do that is to build relationships. You know, I think personal relationships between, you know, individual staff members, executives, all of that, uh, you know, really is worth the time and the investment because it means that when it is time to collaborate, we already have a basis upon which to build, to build that collaborative partnership. So I'm all for, you know, making the rounds and meeting with folks. And, you know, even when there's not a whole lot of work to do, just sort of building that uh, sort of base rapport so that when the time comes, we can actually work together more effectively. Mm -hmm. Great. 
Um, I see another question that just came in and excuse me, I'm gonna read it here. So it says that um, you talk about new goals for the organization, but what about personal goals for this role? How will you strive to make this role different from previous leadership roles and experiences? That's an interesting question. Um, I don't know if I've actually thought about that just yet. Make it different. I think because the organization was in such good shape when I arrived, I don't feel like I had a mandate to like clean house or change anything significant, but really just sort of maintain what's here and build on the solid base that we've already got. Um, so I think that will probably be what I spend most of my time on this, at least this very first year, is really sort of doing a solid assessment of our, of our programs and our finances and our fundraising and our communications and really sort of see what we've got and then continue to build on the good work that has already been, been built by my, by my predecessors. Um, when we do the strategic planning process in January, I think we'll all collectively come to uh, look at some new goals, new directions that we might want to head as an organization. Um, when we think about, you know, heading home, sort of the campaign sort of sunsetting in a couple of years, what do we replace heading home with? You know, what do we do with that time and energy? How do we, what do we learn from heading home as a campaign? How do we effectively evaluate what we've done and, you know, and, uh, distill the best practices from that campaign and really sort of um, build on that good work and continue to make that, make it better. Um, so I think personal goals at least make things better. <laughs> I yeah. guess is the best part of that long-winded response. Yeah, and I also heard, you know, in your conversation with Ebony, I mean, I'm really struck by your identifying the way in which Black mothers um, occupy so much of our uh, program participant population. And, you know, I think your observation of that, right, when you come in and kind of thinking through how we center ourselves around that population, I would say is a, um, a I full thinking through that, I think is also um, a great thing. Um, so another question I saw come through. Raise raise. Is, um, how has the pandemic impacted um, the availability of housing for our program participants? Can you talk a little bit about what we're seeing in terms of placing folks in housing and, and whether and how the pandemic has affected that? It's a good question. I think um, in the city of San Francisco, we've been talking with the real estate team about how it is, uh, how rents have gone down. And so there are more affordable available units. So there are maybe more opportunities for our participants to stay in the city so they don't actually have to move out to any of the other 18 Bay Area counties that we've been housing folks in. And I think that's a, that's a good thing. Um, I don't know if there are other, other ways that pandemic has affected housing supply. I think a lot of people are moving and so there are more available apartments uh, in the city. I've noticed, um, you know, people are discovering that they can in fact work from anywhere. And if they, and, and if they can work from anywhere, why stay here and pay an exorbitant rent? Go some, move somewhere cheap, get a great internet connection and you know, leave that apartment behind. So I think there's, there's more supply perhaps and it may be a little bit cheaper than it was you know, 10 months ago. Yeah, that has been an interesting um, thing that I've also witnessed in some other uh, organizations as well that the rental market has certainly softened. Um, switching gears a little bit, you talked um, with Ebony about the importance of public opinion um, and this empathy gap. Um, and I think you said, you know, that kind of thinking of housing as a human right. Um, I would love just to hear a little bit more about like how, how do we shift the conversation about homelessness to one that is more about um, housing being a human right and that homelessness is actually a social justice issue, um, given uh, the dominant narrative out there right now and, and how hard that can be. And I would just love to hear you um, riff a little bit more about how we as a sector and um, people that support Hamilton families can do that. That's a great question. And if I had the uh, full answer, you know, I'd write a book, but I'll give it a shot and see, see how it comes out. Um, I think part of the way that we can do that is to build empathy. You know, I feel, I think that there is a way in which there's an empathy gap between those who are privileged enough to live in houses and those who are not. And I think that part of our, uh, our job as providers is to not only provide individual level services, you know, to participants, but also to work on a community level around community education and changing public opinion. So I think part of our work has to be about, you know, educating the public about the reality of uh, family homelessness and what it, what causes it and how it's, uh, and how we can solve for it. And I think that um, there are some opportunities for us maybe around social marketing to sort of really sort of highlight, you know, the, the, the delicacies of the challenges around family homelessness in particular that may change how people think about it. I think 
in San Francisco, it's altogether too easy to, you know, walk by homeless people and ignore or not see, have your eyes sort of slide over. And, you know, it's even more so, I think, for, for homeless families who are, tend to be invisible in, in the streets because they are doubled up. Uh, they're living in a car or they're, you know, couch surfing with relatives or what have you. So you don't actually see, you know, children on, and families on the street. So that the realities of family and homelessness are not, are not in the public's eye. And I think we can do, uh, we have a job to do around sort of centering that reality in the public, in public eye and changing public opinion about, about folks who are experiencing homelessness. We definitely have a, a ways to go on that in San Francisco, I would say, sure. but, you know, does not mean that we don't keep trying and um, keep offering a different narrative, um, which Hamilton does, and so proud to be a part of it. Um, you know, I, in terms of this moment that we're living in, you know, pick your word, unprecedented, challenging, difficult, um, all the things. Um, you know, I have been reflecting a lot lately on that um, adage, you know, never let a crisis go to waste. And, you know, we are in a crisis moment. We are in lots of compounding crises, I would say, you know, so whether it's COVID, economic uncertainty, the racial reckoning, our electoral system, climate change, you name it, right? I know, sorry, I'm, I'm going to come out of this. I, where I want to go is I kind of get your thoughts as a leader, as a leader of an organization, um, a really important one. I'm just kind of curious about um, your thoughts of, of that adage, never let a crisis go to waste, and kind of how you feel about the opportunity of this moment and where you see Hamilton being able to seize opportunity in these really challenging times that we're living in. Yeah, I think, you know, I love that adage and I, and I think, and I love it that you raise it here. Um, I think there are a couple of things for us as Hamilton families um, in this peculiar moment. I think the opportunity here is that we can envision solutions to homelessness that were impossible to imagine 10 months ago. You know, I think if you'd asked me 10 months ago whether or not we'd be having an argument with the city about stepping down hotels that had been commandeered by the city to put homeless people in, I would have laughed because that was a possibility that was impossible to imagine 10 months ago. But here we are in this moment and we're having this conversation about how do we rehouse, you know, homeless people who have been put into, uh, into ho hotels so they can shelter in place. Um, so I think there's an opportunity around sort of seizing the peculiarity of this moment and really sort of digging for the innovative, out of the box, creative, new solution that we can really apply to, to for, for our long-term success, you know, in, in solving for uh, family homelessness. Mm -hmm. I think the other opportunity for Hamilton Family that I see is that we have an opportunity to really build our muscle around advocacy. Mm -hmm. That I think it's really clear, you know, that our political system from the national level all the way to our municipal system has, has cracks, it has fissures and flaws. And there are places where we can push to solve for some of those things along with other organizations and other companies to really sort of you know, push for a systemic solution to some of these problems so that they don't, so that homelessness doesn't happen at all. And I think that's part of what we've been talking about on staff is we're really sort of building our capacity to, uh, to connect lawmakers to the experiences of our participants such that when they make decisions, they, have, they are drawing on the, experience, the, the lived experiences of our participants to help them shape their, their decision making. Yeah. Um, thank you. That the example of, of the way that California has um, leveraged our hotel space um, to house our unhoused neighbors is a great example of, you know, here we are and oh, look, we have this asset we can use. So I appreciate that. And we have to figure out how to keep that available um, to folks. I have a question here from um, fellow board member Anne. Um, how are we helping children who are out of school learn? Are we able to support them so that they don't fall behind? And as we know, Hamilton family serves lots of children and this is a very difficult time in terms of remote learning uh, for families. And so can you talk to us a little bit about what um, the organization is doing in terms of helping children learn? Sure, that's a great question. It's really top of mind for, for, for us as an organization um, because we know that our you know, black and brown kids are likely to fall behind anyway. And I think in the absence of you know, in-person learning, that's more likely to happen. So what we've been doing for starters is um, we've been taking donations of computers and uh, tablets so that families can have uh, laptops at home so they can do the distance learning that their kids need. Um, I think to date we've collected maybe at least 200 um, laptops and distributed them to our participants across 19 counties. Um, and it's been quite, quite a job. Um, we've had a, a generous outpouring 
from tech companies, from individuals, from all over the place, um, getting the actual hardware to the people who need it so they can do distance learning with their kids at school um, at home. The other thing we've been doing is helping particularly monolingual Spanish speaking parents sort of navigate these new technology, these new technological tools. Uh, there are some folks in, in our shelter in our transitional housing center program um, who needed help learning how to use Zoom and you know, navigate SFUSD's websites and so on. And so we've had our bilingual staff working with those families to help them navigate those systems. Um, the other thing I will say is that in our two residential programs, we have learning, we have established learning hubs so that um, the, the response doesn't fall entirely on the parents. And so we have staff who are helping uh, do some coaching and help do some tutoring with kids um, on every day in the learning hubs in both uh, residential, in our shelter and in our transitional housing program. Right, so what I'm hearing is um, technology and individualized attention and support. And I just um, can't help but connect dots in terms of, you know, it's also, this is where having a staff that mirrors the population we serve helps. So the fact that we have Spanish speaking bilingual staff that can serve the families um, in terms of communicating with them, um, I think is really important. And this is where it shows up in quality of programming. So, um, Really appreciate that. Um, let's see, I see another question coming in. Um, what's your main life experience you'll draw upon when continuing to lead Hamilton into its next era? So this goes back to maybe a little bit more of a personal uh, anecdote or, or thought from you about your life experience and, and how it will help you and shape you in terms of um, your leadership of Hamilton families. That's a good question. Um... And it is a personal one. It is a, it's a personal connection for me. You know, I grew up in New York City in Harlem, early 1970s. My, we lived in public housing. Uh, we were always struggling for income. My mom was single most of the time that I was growing up. So I have an affinity for, you know, black women who are single, single mothers. Um, I watched my mom struggle. I watched her, you know, scrape it together, but keep it all together. And, you know, it's that experience, you know, I have, I have great empathy for, you know, black and brown women who are who find themselves struggling to keep their kids whole, to keep their families safe, to keep their families educated, and to get them to that next level. So, you know, I I, I feel a very strong affinity for our for our participants, um, you know, from my own personal experience, but also I think intellectually I have a connection. I feel that you know I was lucky enough to be given gifts, and you know I feel like I feel a strong responsibility to give back to share those gifts back with the community. So, so. That sort of early lived experiences really sort of shapes shapes my leadership here at Hamilton. Great, thank you for continuing to share um, some of that with us. Um, just trying to track. I have another one jotted down from earlier, which is kind of a practical one. We have a lot of partners um, on this call today. And, you know, so my question is, you know, how can partners support um, the team, especially essential workers uh, right now? Are there specific ways um, that our partners can help in terms of um, the essential staff that is working day in and day out for Hamilton right now? Sure, that's a great question. Um, I think, the things that we most need, obviously, are time and money. Um, you know, it's hard to have volunteers now, just given the situation, but eventually we will need volunteers to help us do the work. I think, um, you know, volunteers are, they help keep our, keep our, our work cost effective. I mean, we could never hire enough hands to do all the volume of the work that we do. So we will always need volunteers and we'll always need money to do it. I think the other couple of ways that I think that our partners can help is to use their platforms to do the kinds of public education and empathy gap bridging that I think needs to also happen at the community level. Um, you know, whether that's if you're Google, you have a huge platform, you know, to, to educate the public, you know, in, in small bites, or, you know, if you are a company that, you know, has billboards up, and, you know, highlighting the, the realities of families experiencing homelessness could be useful to use your platform that way. Um, the other way I think that uh, our, our partners can help is in our advocacy efforts. You know, when we go to some of the, when we go to City Hall, when we go to Sacramento, it's usually the same cast of characters, you know, saying the same things to the same administrators who are, they know what we're going to say, and they say it back to us. And it's kind of a, it's a, it's a deadlock in some ways. But if we were to have new voices added with us in the, on the advocacy front, we might actually make some headway. So I, I would invite our partners to also come join us when we go to City Hall, come join us when we talk to the mayor, 
come join us when we talk to the Department of Housing, Homelessness and Supportive Housing, because we need those voices added to ours to make them, to make them really hear us. That, I think those are the three ways that I would, I would add for our partners to help us. Great. Um, okay, another one that I see coming through a direct chat is what are some of your, a lot of, everyone's interested in your goals, Curio. Um, what are some of your personal goals for the year? Personal goals for the year. Get a strategic plan off of the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, really sort of do some work around the equity, di diversity and inclusion work that was already started uh, with the Justice Collective earlier this year. Um, I think we've made some significant progress uh, on, those, on, on that work and I wanna see us continue that work. I wanna see us, as I said earlier, sort of reorient our program around the, the lived experiences of black and brown single moms and really sort of think about what that, what that looks like um, and, and really sort of recenter our work around that, that experience. Um, those are the three biggest ones so far. Um, oh, and, and the fourth is one more. Raise a whole lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good that's, one. That's, that's one that, uh, you know, is part of, part of my job and part of my responsibility. And I'm looking forward to working with partners to really, you know, raise the resources that we need to do the work that we've committed to doing. Those are all really good ones. Funny Paige is coming through saying, no, she wants to hear about personal goals, like what you're going to binge watch next. But I'm actually <laughs> going to go back to Schitt's Creek, which is also a favorite of mine, and ask you who your favorite character on Schitt's Creek is. Oh, gosh. I think Patrick is my favorite character on oh, Schitt's Creek, oh. I have um, a soft spot for Patrick, too. That's a good one. Just so earnest and lovable. Like, so, I don't know. I just found him a great addition to, this, to the cast. Yeah. Um, but next, we've been watching Nurse Jackie lately, which is kind of a pivot from Shit's Creek. Uh, also, a profoundly well written show. I really, I, I really love that show. Um, and recently, I, I picked up Marion Zimmer Bradley's *The Mists of Avalon*. I don't know if you, any of you, read this book. It's she wrote it. It's old. It's from the late '70s, early '80s. But it's sort of a retelling of the Arthur story, the King Arthur story through the, through the voices of the women around him. So his mom and his sister, and the, it, she retells this entire story from the perspective of, of the women around him. And it's a fascinating way to look at the Arthurian legend. It's, it's really good. The Mists of Avalon, I recommend it most highly. All right, definitely. And since I have hostess prerogative, I'll also um, encourage the crown season four just came out so good uh haven't binge watched all of them uh yet the latest episodes but love me some crown um okay so with that i'm just gonna hand it off to you for some kind of final words um curio like i said just so looking forward to working with you uh welcome to ham fam um you're in it now and we're just so delighted and lucky to have you so uh, the floor is yours thank you karina I just want to say thank you to everybody who's been so warm and then welcome with me, so supportive of my, uh, of, of my, of me and my new role here. Um, I really appreciate all of you for the the work that you've done to get at the organization to where it is. I think I have I've have the honor and privilege of occupying a seat um, that had great predecessors, Jason, Tamika, Jeff. I mean, I just feel like there's been exemplary leadership for this organization um, all along, and I hope to continue in that tradition. So thank you all for for coming out tonight. And thank you all for supporting Hamilton families. And I really look forward to, to continuing our conversations.